entrepreneur, chartered accountant, and operator of growth businesses, Andy Lekumalo is the CEO of Broadcast Group, an investor in the technology, media, and telecommunications sectors. Kumalo is the former managing director of Power 98.7 and the former COO of MSG Africa, whose subsidiaries include radio stations like Power FM, Capricorn FM, the communications firm, a PR and events agency, and television production firm, Quizzical Pictures. Kumalo is also the founder of I Am An Entrepreneur, a national summit designed to help entrepreneurs become better leaders of their businesses by imparting the skills they need to thrive. Probably all the way back to high school, really, when I discovered that all I really wanted to be was an entrepreneur. And I, I still look back to that time. It's quite an important time for me to figure out really what I wanted to do in my life, you know. Later on in life, you get to meet friends and you realize that it's actually quite a gift to know that earlier in your career. Um, you look at the best people in the world and what they do. You look at Lionel Messi, Cristiano Ronaldo, Michael Jackson, Whitney Houston. You look at all these people that just became legends and it's, and it's quite a same story, right? They, they knew when they were relatively young that they had this talent or this passion and that's why they're the world's greatest. So I was quite fortunate to learn that at a relatively young age and all I pretty much did is follow that passion. And uh, I ended up becoming a chartered accountant thanks to the opportunity I was given by Deloitte. I ended up working for an investment bank called Investec. And that all kind of set me up for a career in business uh, because I had kind of the basic training, but I also had the hunger and, and the want to, to do well as, as an entrepreneur. Us as a group of people who have had the opportunity, because so many don't, have to create that kind of pipeline, that kind of opportunity. And for me, that opportunity is entrepreneurship because the tenets of entrepreneurship is being self-started, it's being self-motivated, it's being self-disciplined, it's backing yourself, it's hustling, it's seeing the tough times, it's going through the difficult times and coming out kind of at the end. And the beauty of what brings us all here together is what are you after? You're after a better life. You want to live better. That's really your, your kind of primary objective. But you're living better and you're pursuing this live better lifestyle, then allows for other people to also have dignity because you create work, you create opportunity. Whether you actually employ the people or you're giving a kind of outsourced work or you're bringing in people to do work for you to help you manufacture something or provide a service, entrepreneurship creates that dignity, creates that opportunity. Now, nothing else does that. Education doesn't do that. Public service doesn't do that. Big business doesn't do that. The ability to create something from nothing and therefore create a better life for yourself is the only thing that can create all that opportunity for many other people. So for me, entrepreneurship is, is bigger than the next billionaire because we're all going to be okay. Like if we've made it this far, we're probably going to be all right. It's bigger than us though. It's about what kind of opportunity we create for the people that come after us. Just the whole view we have of credit. You know, when you, when you grow up um, short, or when you grow up wanting, and, you, and it's never enough. You know, as a child, when you're still young, you don't really see the difference. You get older, you learn not to even ask questions because you realize that we don't have enough, but you know what, this is just how we live around here. And so, so you start like believing things that aren't true. And one of the things that a lot of us believed was that credit was bad. Don't borrow. It's horrible to owe somebody money. You know, make your own money, spend your own money. That's dignity, that's rubbish. Credit is created in financial systems to be able to take risk off you, but they charge you for that risk, right? So, so you want to buy something you don't have the cash for, or you don't have the appetite to take on the risk, someone will give you that cash, but they'll charge you for the ability and the right and the privilege you had for taking their money, because they need to make a return on the money they lent you. So it's an economic system. It's not a question of whether you're poor or rich, or whether you're successful or not successful. It's a tool that you can use to make yourself better. So credit is your friend. The key though is how you use the credit and how, and if you understand how credit works, you can use credit to your benefit. And credit really works with high risk, high reward. If you're a high risk client, the bank will charge you a hell of a lot of interest. If you're using the money for unsecured purpose, credit card, 
um, 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 unsecured loans, those kind of loans are expensive because the bank has no security. If you're buying a home, you're buying a business, it's a lot more security. My mom bought all my clothes at stores on credit. I don't remember my mom ever paying cash for my uniform or for things that I needed. Now, she lived on credit because she clearly had to get the stuff, didn't have enough money. Now, in that instance, it was still good credit for her because she got to clothe her child. But in an environment where you have a choice, you shouldn't be buying clothes on credit. Protect your record so you can have the credit. So that indeed, if your child needs uniform, you have an avenue to get it. So it is your friend. Even at times, even if you don't use it appropriately, it's still your friend. So the first principle I was talking about with credit was, it's very important that you understand it's your friend, you know how to use it, you use productive debt, not unproductive debt. Consumption debt is unproductive. Growth debt is productive. So number one when it comes to savings, I think the very important thing is to understand the difference between savings and investments. And the fact that there's room for both. So in your portfolio of making sure that you secure yourself uh, the ability to live better, you need to look, both of, look at both those things and have room for a new life. Savings tend to be very secure, right? So the products of savings are around fixed deposit, government bonds, tax-free savings accounts. There's gonna be a lot that has to go wrong for you to lose your capital. But because the risk is so low, right, the returns are also low. Right? So your capital is pretty secured, 99.9% of the time you're not going to lose it, and therefore your returns are not going to be great. When it comes to investment, depending on which product you're going for, whether it's buying property, or you're buying equities, or you're buying bitcoins, or whatever it is you're buying, there's a bigger element of risk. Right? Because the price point or the value of whatever asset you're buying is on the basis of how well it's traded. So if you buy a standoff share, well, you know that things are not going so well. If you buy a Capitec share, you know that things are going very well, especially if you bought it 20 years ago. So with investment, there's a lot more risk, but there's also higher reward. And with savings, a lot less risk, a lot less reward. That's the first thing. The second thing is that it's a habit. You have to absolutely do it habitually. It's not something you do as and when. And you know, when you do it habitually, you find places. So one of my favorite things is, every time I have excess income, before I even think of something crazy I want to buy myself, I'm already putting it at different places I've created. So I've got a stock account. What does a stock account do? I buy shares there, right? I've got a guy who advises me what to buy. I debate with him, I argue with him. I make the final decision. If I lose money, it's my money. But if I make money, it's great. That's my investment. Then I take advantage of my tax-free savings account, right? The government allows me 33,000 rand a year that I can invest and they do not tax any return I make. I take advantage of it every year. Maximum, I think of about a 500,000 in your lifetime. Why wouldn't you do that? It's free money. Put it in there, right? Fixed deposit, maybe. Savings account, maybe. Maybe overpay my bond, because then I save myself a little bit of interest. So I've got all of these places that I've created in my savings, my investment life, where the money can kind of go into. So it's a habit. Number two, everybody can do it. People typically say, I don't earn enough money, and delay, I can't save. You know, my money runs out by the 15th of the month. I gotta survive the last two weeks on transport money just to get my salary again at the end of the month. That may be true. Indeed, times are tough. But if you adopt the principle of paying yourself first, you'd be amazed that you'll still live within the means that you got left. And I read this book that I, that, 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 that I spoke about a little bit earlier on uh, uh, called The Richest Man in Babylon. The Richest Man in Babylon is a little book. It's yellow, you can finish it in a few hours. The number one rule of the richest man in Babylon, it tells an ancient story of how the richest man in Babylon became the richest man in Babylon, is that he took 10% of everything he earned, Loiso, and he paid himself first. But what do we do as parents, and as responsible adults, and as entrepreneurs? We pay everyone else first, don't we? <coughs> we pay our bond, we pay our insurance, medical aid, rent, car, children's school fees. And then if there's something left, right? There's something for us. Yeah? Turn that model upside down. My advice is pay yourself first. And in the book, Richest Man in Babylon, the rule of thumb was 10%. And their number one rule is that take 10% for yourself. And the 10% uh, uh, principle, the 10% principle comes from the tithing system where biblically back in those days, they would take literally 10% of what they make and, and give it on the altar. So the, the, the book talks about the fact that 
So the book talks about the fact that you should take 10% of whatever you make and give it to yourself. Then you'll be surprised that you will always live in the 90%. You absolutely need to find a way to create more sources of income than one. Many people have got jobs out there, whether you're professionals, or you're lucky enough to be, to be employed. If you are fortunate enough to be employed, that's great. But you and I both know you have other talents. There's other things you could pursue. There's something else you can do to generate that inc other income. You may be lazy, you may not be feeling like it, you may be a little despondent, there could be other reasons. But you certainly have the time. You certainly have the ability. So my piece of advice is, don't create dependence on your primary income. Keep your primary income, because that's the stuff that keeps you alive. But how else are you going to prosper? Gone are the days where you wait for a gold watch after 30 years of work. That's not that life no longer happens. Even employers nowadays are a lot more open to the idea of people who've got other sources of income. Use it. Create those sources of income. Give yourself the opportunity to generate more income for yourself. The rest of the world, guys, understands the dynamics of the gig economy. You've got a skill, you've got a passion, you've got a gift. There's something else you can do other than your primary source of income. What the hell are you waiting for? Why are you waiting? If you can do it, why aren't you doing it? Most people in the world do it. And most companies, by the way, are learning that you millennials of today are different employees. That's how you roll. That's just what it is. All right? You're working from home, you're hot spotting, but you're also doing gigs. Do gigs. Have other things that earn you income. Always shop for the best rates. Banks are competing it's a very competitive space we've got new digital banks coming now capitech will tell you they've got the best rates they might have them now but i'm telling you there's competitors out there who are trying to get your business right so go out there and search for the best rates you can get especially when it comes to savings so you don't have to overthink the fact that who am i placing my money with if it's a south african bank that's registered and authorized service provider chances are our system and our governance system have checked them out and they like you to be decent. So if they give you a great return, go for the great return, especially in the savings product. When you start investing money, you have to do a lot more due diligence work, I think. With savings, go for the best rate, is my advice. It's not rocket science. If you earn a thousand rand, spend less than a thousand rand, you will be broke. So the first principle is always spend less than what you make. If you want to spend more, make more. Don't spend more and make the same amount of money because then you'd be broke because you would have overspent your earnings. So the number one principle has got to be spend less than what you earn. If you have an appetite to spend more because you're just that person, then make more. That time you're spending at night and on weekends sitting around, generate income if you really want to spend more money. Absolutely always pay yourself first. Everybody can live within their means. This idea that you get paid a salary, you pay your bond, you pay your car, you pay school fees, you pay insurance, you pay medical aid, the debit orders go crazy, and then you're left with a few thousand rands for yourself. Then you must survive. Why? Who worked? The medical aid didn't work, school fees didn't work, you worked the whole month. So the first thing I suggest you do, take 10%, pay yourself. In the 90, everyone will fit, they always do. Money, family, and friends. My goodness, if there's one thing that has split friends and families has been money. I blame the person who gives the money in the first place. Because you see, a family member comes and asks you for help. You're the one who decides to give them the money. The problem is that you think you're gonna get it back. Here's the truth, chances of you getting it back are close to no. So if you want to help your family member, accept day one that you're probably not going to get the money back. Just don't tell them that. In the outside, hope that they'll pay you one day. And when they do take the money and run, don't ask questions. But largely, if, you, if, you, if you're going to part with money for a reason bigger than a commercial reason, you care about the friend, you're helping them out, a family member needs something, you're helping them out, stop thinking that's a loan way. You can charge interest or actually going to get it back. You're better off, you sleep better at night if you just assume that you're probably not gonna get the money back. The only known life we have is this one. So why would you work hard, earn a decent living, but not live the lifestyle that you want because you're busy saving for some rainy day? What if it never rains? So you have to have a balanced view of these things. You know, it's the same as children. I have kids. I absolutely am a responsible father. I'm taking care of what happens to them when I stop working or if something had to happen to me. 
but I'm not going to live my life because I'm dedicated to my kids' lifestyle being great one day, and I then for rob myself of the life that I want. So it's important to have a balanced view, right? Decide what lifestyle you want, work hard for it, but most importantly, live it. Make sure you live the life that you want to live. How do I live better? I, I live one life. I don't live two lives, I don't live three lives. I don't understand what work-life balance is. For me, it's all one integrated, unified life. So in every day that I live, I try to live the life that Andy Kumalo wants to live. Some days, one thing is more important than the other. On the weekend, my family is a lot more important than work. Do I sometimes work on weekends? Yeah, but the priority is gonna be family. Monday to Friday, work is priority. Do I spend time with my family? Of course, yeah. Uh, but sometimes it's gonna be more work than there is family. Most importantly for me, to live better is to find the lifestyle you wanna continuously live. So I'm a big fan of regular short holidays. I'm not a fan of three week holidays once a year because I don't wanna wait until December for me to live the life that I want because some guy decided that we should all go on holiday in December. I wanna go to 10 different destinations in the year whether I'm working, I'm taking my children, it's just me and my wife, but I want to continuously live that life. And for me to do that, I obviously have to work hard. I obviously have to prioritize. But what keeps me sane is that I live one life. That way, I can stay true to who I am.